Okay, so I'm going to try to record this. I'm using a very uh, low-end hardware, so it will be quite crappy, then we realize how crappy it will be, and then maybe upgrade the hardware or not, depending on, or abandon the idea. But okay, let's talk about science. And yeah, so we won't have any serious definition today. We'll be doing some motivating examples and motivating facts to, to be able to later relate what we did show what is in today to what we will define next week or in the next few weeks. Because yeah. so today we spend the first half of the of the lecture on planar graphs. What's planar graph? Everybody knows. I hope. In fact, so we're looking at planar graphs. Yeah. So just a bit of notation like nomenclature, a graph, you have got vertices, yep, and you have got edges, yep, you have got some edges, and you can draw them on a plane or on a sphere, and in planar graphs you can draw them so that there are points and these curves that represent edges don't cross each other. That's obvious and I don't want to go into this, into this lecture, into the details of defining embeddings and this type of things, this is not the topic of this lecture. So I will rely on the very intuitive definition and understanding what's an embedding and what's a planar graph up there. In normal graphs, we have got vertices, we have got edges, but in graphs embedded on the surface, and we'll call them plane graphs. <coughs> so this is like a stupid nomenclature problem. A plane graph is a graph together with an embedding in the plane, and a planar graph is a graph that admits an embedding. So this is like a graph that you can embed, but there's no fixed embedding. You can uh, ensure yourself that the subgraph will have many very different embeddings and that's sometimes a problem. And plane graph is already a fixed embedding. So this is a fixed embedding of a graph. It has got edges, it has got vertices, but it has got also faces. Okay, so this graph here, it has got six vertices, it has got uh, one, two, seven edges, and it has got uh, three faces, because there's one face, second face, and this face around it, okay? So there are three faces. Up there, uh, yep, that makes sense. And yeah, so this is the planar graph, and um, we'll be interested only, we'll be interested only in embeddings where every face is symmetric to a disk, which for planar graphs is the same as we are looking only at connected graphs, yeah? Because if you have a disconnected graph, so there's a second connected component here, then the, like this outer face now becomes not a disk, but uh, like, it, uh, <coughs> okay, if you think of this as an embedding on a sphere, so that everything is wrapped up on a sphere, then with a connected graph, the outer face is also a disk in a like, topological sense, but if you draw two connected components, then suddenly there's like a punctured disk, like, like torus, uh, not the torus, but like a, a ring up there. So we'll be interested only in connected planar graphs, so up here connected. Just to ensure that every face, including the outer face, if we embed it on a sphere, is isomorphic to a disk. That's like something, some regularization that we'll do without bigger loss of generality because everything we talk, or most of the things we're speaking about, can be like independently done on connected components. So we're mostly focusing today on connected graphs, on connected planar graphs. And in planar graphs, so we want to talk about sparsity. And sparsity is about like counting edges versus vertices in different settings. So it's about like saying that planar graph has got only a few edges, not it can't be too dense. And we, we will be trying not to use any arguments based on really topology here, because we would like to make our arguments and generalize it to larger graph classes, not only planar graphs, and keep the simplicity of like edge counting arguments without using too complicated topological arguments. Okay? So what does it mean for planar graphs? Well, for planar graphs, the starting point is the well-known Euler's formula, which says that if we take the vertices, subtract edges, and add faces, it will always be two. Yeah, this is, I hope, two, uh, unless I messed up something. So let's write it down. There's the theorem, Euler's formula. How do I fit into it? Yeah, that's fine. There's Euler's formula that says that if G a connected plane graph and you just a connected plane graph and there's like n vertices m edges and f faces then we have got always m plus f minus m is always two okay 
And the proof, I guess everybody can do it, but let's do it formally. We've got the induction. Say on the number of edges, the natural number of edges, base case. The base case, the easiest base case actually is if G is a tree. If G is a tree, tree, then in a tree you have got one less edge than vertices. Yeah, I mean you can prove it again by induction, but I think. So we get M is equal to M plus one, and there's one place. Yeah, if G is a tree, if G is a tree, if G is a tree, there's like one face spying everything outside. Okay? And now you can do computations. N plus F minus M gives two. Okay, so this is okay. Okay, in the general case, in the inductive case, uh -huh. let me try now this. this. Okay, in the inductive step, we have got uh, an inductive step. If G is not a, mm, not a tree, that means that it's connected, not a tree, that means that there's a cycle. So there's a cycle in G. G and we can, and the, this cycle, and say pick one edge on this cycle, this one edge on this cycle, and this cycle certifies two things. First, that G minus A, E is still connected. Okay, if you remove one edge from a cycle, the graph is still connected because the rest <coughs> of the cycle connects the two guys that you just removed the edge from. So it's still connected. And E was incident with two phases. Yeah? If you have got a cycle, and there's this edge A, then this face on the one side and this face on the other side, there are different faces. E incident with two faces. With two different faces. With two different faces. Which means that in <coughs> if you look at the G and G minus E, if you look at the number of vertices, if you look at the number of vertices, if here's N, then there's the same number of vertices. If there are m edges, then you lost one, one edge because you deleted it, but you also lost one, lose one face. Yeah. I deleted an edge and merged two faces into one. Okay, there are two different distinct edges, two distinct faces because the cycle didn't allow these faces to be the same. You cannot connect them because of the cycle. That means that you lost one face and lost one edge. So by induction, if this was if this was true before, it's also true for G because you add one to this negative term and add one to this positive term up there. Okay, so we have proven Euler's formula. And now, with this Euler's formula, we can prove some, uh, some sparsity bounds for the planar graphs. So this is the bounds that like most of you have seen in some form. And this is like generally like what I want to prove is that uh, corollary of this thing to say that if G is planar, uh, uh, then the number of vertices, the number of edges, is less than three times the number of vertices. Okay, uh, so that's what I want to prove, and probably most of you can prove it using one way or another. But I want to show you a way of expressing the same proof you know with the language that will be useful for later exercises, namely discharge. So I want to prove it in a slightly more complicated way that you usually know the proof of such lemma, but I want to use discharging just to teach you a language of proving more complicated statements of this type, more complicated sparsity statements. So I'll be using discharging. What does it mean? Discharging is really a fancy way of expressing double counting arguments. It's really like I want to count the same things in a few different settings and check that they should be the same and see what's up there, I mean, double counting. So here, the, but double counting would be happening by like first setting up some charges on the, on the vertices, edges, and face of the graph, counting how many I put, how much charge I put, then moving around by some local rules, and then counting again, and checking what's the outcome in the end, okay? So the example speaks more than some blah, 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 general blah, blah, so let's try it. So first, let's put a charge every vertex, Get the charge of plus six. Every face gets the charge of plus six, and every edge gets the charge of minus six. Okay. What do I want to say? I want to put charges, and so like think of really like charges or like some values or like some potential. If you prefer some abstract notions, but this is a potential. Some potential we call it charge, and we 
put a every vertex something, every face something, something, edge something. This is the usual setup, that vertex and the faces get something and the edge gets minus something. Because now with Euler's formula that we know from, we say that the total charge is exactly plus 12. Okay? Yeah, because the number of vertices plus number of faces minus number of edges is 2. So there's like 2 plus 6 is more than minus 6 is, which means that in total we put plus 20, plus 12 on the entire graph if we sum up everything. Now we do the moving of the uh, of the charge. So the charge will be as follows. So we do two rules here. The first rule is that every phase takes its plus six and splits its evenly between the between the incident edges. So every phase looks how long, how many edges it sees, or how long <coughs> is the walk along this how long along this uh, this phase and takes the charge and splits it evenly. We allow, um, uh, allow non-integer numbers, so this one actually sends 5 over 6 to every of these edges. One important thing to note is that uh, if there is a face looking like this, so this is still valid here, this, there's a face up there, then this face actually sends 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, it splits its charge over <coughs> nine parts. This edge is counted twice. Yeah, I take a face and walk around the face and count how many edges I see. If there's like a bridge like this one that it's seen twice on a face, it receives the double amount of charge. Okay, that's an important notion. So this is like, so every face splits evenly. So face evenly between edges, it's in the edges. So these are like, look up, I mean, this Look, I think, and the second thing I want to try is that every vertex sends one to the incident edges. So every vertex sends plus one to every incident edge. Okay? <coughs> so every vertex sends plus one to every incident edge. Every incident edge. Okay? So let us now make an analysis what's the final state of the charge after this room. So every face sends all the charge, every vertex sends plus one to every single vertex, and see what's up there. So, so the final analysis will be as follows. Well, face uses all charge and doesn't receive any charge. I mean, everything is sent to an ed ed edges. So faces get discharged completely. Yeah, so faces can be Okay. The important observation is that edges are still cannot be positive. Yeah? Because what's happened to edge? Edge, there's this edge here, started by minus six. Okay, it started from minus six. It got plus one from here. It got plus one from here. Okay? And it got something from the faces. But the important part, and this is like the crucial observation in the proof you know, is that the face needs to have at least three edges. I mean, we, we think of simple graphs, we don't allow multiple edges, which means that the face needs to be of length at least three, which means that the face splits its charge among at least three guys, which means that it receives at most plus two from this face and at most plus two from this face. Okay? An edge takes a plus six and splits at least at three at least three shareholders. <coughs> so it needs to say at least one twelve. So the edge receives one, one, at most two, at most two. So it's it cannot be more than zero. It can become positive. It can be zero, but it can become positive. So the edge is at most zero. Okay. And vertex? Well, vertex is. I mean, we can at least say at vertex. Vertex starts with 6 and then loses its degree. So I will use D for the degree because deg will be used for something else. So I'll use D for the degree and sometimes put a subscript of the graph if the graph is important for us, so this is the degree. So the vertex starts with 6 and loses the number of edges it has, the degree of the vertex in the process. Okay, so we have got this. Mm. Okay, uh, yep. uh, so uh, that's the final part. So, but we have zero, at most zero, and we started with plus 12. Okay? This plus 12 needs to go somewhere. I mean, there needs to be some place with positive charge. And we start with positive charge. Which first, there needs to be a guy of degree at most, say, five, because this is the only guy that has got positive degree, the positive charge. I mean, posit uh, to get positive charge, you cannot have degree more than five. 
So the first part we proved here is that there is a vertex that exists. Oh, I think I need to now rotate it a bit. <coughs> Sorry. So that this part we see. So the first corollary A is that there exists a vertex with degree of vertex is most five because the positive charge has to go somewhere. But the second part, let's sum up things, yeah? So what we prove is that the sum over the vertices of G, uh, 6 minus degree, vertex of V, is like at least plus 12. Yeah, this is what we got here. And uh, yeah, because we started plus 12, edges have got non-positive, faces have got 0. So the, mm, so the sum of the, so so the sum of the charges on the vertices need to be this plus 12, because that's the only place where the positive charge can end up. And now the important, if we do the summing, OK, if we sum over vertices 6, this is 6 number of vertices. And now the point is the most important <coughs> lemma of this lecture is that if you sum the degrees, you get twice the number of edges. Yep, because every edge is seen twice. So minus twice the number of vertices, this is at least 12 which means that the number of edges is at most 3 and minus 6. That's what we wanted. OK? Uh, yep. So this is like a sparsity lemma, in a sense. It says that the number of vertices, the number of edges of a planar graph, the number of edges of planar graph are its most three times the number of, of, uh, three times the number of vertices. And there's, so there's a vertex of degree at most 5. I mean, you can deduce this one from this one. Obvious. OK, so we proved some basic sparsity thing. That was like something most of you have probably seen one way or another before. But let's try to make some use of it. So the first thing I want to now use is that I want to make a coloring algorithm. So what I want to say here, and I think I want to go back to the, ori to the original board and start from here again. Let's check how I put the camera. Good. So let me, let me wipe out the start. Okay. So what I want to say here is that the trivial corollary of this one, so the corollary, is that uh, planar graphs are six corollaries. Yeah, so what does it mean six corollary? Let us remind us. We have got like the so a bracket, function c, and numbers one up to k. This is a k corollary if for every edge, you get different colors in the endpoints. Yeah. So you <coughs> want to assign colors of the vertices so that two incident vertices have got different endpoints, two adjacent vertices have got different colors, two adjacent vertices have got different colors, and G is K okay, color over if there exists a K coloring of the and the chromatic number is minimum k and is k corrupt. Yep, that's like bracket. Just as a reminder from graph theory, which a notion that we have probably seen. So we want to color the vertices. This is one of the hard things to understand about the graphs. How many colors do we need to color it? And planar graphs are cis corrupt. Let's show should see the proof. Well, take this planar graph, G. And by our lemma up there, there is a vertex of degree at most 5. So this is a vertex of degree at most 5. OK? Hide it, delete it from the graph, find the next vertex of degree at most 5. This guy has got, so this guy has got at most 5 edges. <coughs> we take the next graph of degree at most 5, it again has got at most 5 edges. It may have got a 6 edge here, but it has got at most 5 edges going to the left. OK? Take the next vertex of the grid most five in the remaining graph, and then it's got at most five edges going to the to the left. And we order the vertices in this manner until we peel out the entire graph. So in a sense, we peel out the vertices of the grid at most five until we remove the entire graph up there. Okay? So this is like pro simple inductive state inductive procedure that removes the vertex of the grid most five and repeats and orders the vertices from right to left. Okay? <coughs> and now we have got this property that we order the vertices from v1 up to the n, such that the number of neighbors, such that the number of 
the, the number of ej such that ei ej is an edge and i is smaller than j, this is at most 5 for every day. Okay? So we have ordered the vertices, so the number of left neighbors of every guy is at most 5. Okay? And now we can do the coloring. Okay? We have the left neighbors are the neighbors that are still in the graph when we deleted the vertex. Okay? This should be a set of the i's, right? Mm. In the set of all the i's. The i's, of course. Yep, you're right. Okay? So we go, uh, uh, yes. and now we color from right to left. Yeah? We color these vertices, and whenever we want to color a vertex, we look at this at most five neighbors. There are at most five colors used here, so we can choose a sixth color, because we have got six colors here, for this vertex up there. Okay? This is a sim simple color. Yeah? We just go from first peel up to get this ordering, and then go right to left and to greedy. Always take the color not used by the neighbors that are already colored. You can always do it. Okay? That was simple. Some of you may know uh, how, why planar graphs are five color. So who knows why planar graphs are five color? There's a few ones. And who knows that planar graphs are four color? Most of you know. Okay. So planar graphs are four color. They're, no, they're also five color. The four color theorem proof is something you cannot show in the, on the table. If I have, I could present five colorability proof here that some of you know, but I don't do it because the five colorability proof, this is proof using some notion called Kempe chains, and this is a very topological proof about how does the plane behaves and why two, two things cannot cross at some moment. And this is exactly the type of the proof we are not going to lose in the lecture. This is exactly the type of the proof, the Kempe chain proof, this is exactly the type of the proof we are not going to use in the lecture, we are going to avoid this type of the proofs because we want to rely on this type of notions, like there's an ordering when every guy has got five vertices to the left, and this type of things, instead of the topological arguments of the Kempe chain. Okay? So for us, planar graph is corrupt and we don't, know, don't want to know about less colors. But let us squeeze out some notions from here. Let us squeeze away some, some, some notions from here. Okay? So the first idea, the first notions we need, are the, like minimum, maximum, and this degree. And minimum, maximum, and average degree. I'm wiping out some stuff here. Okay? So let's do some definitions. Let's do some definitions. So we have got minimum, maximum, and average degree of a graph. Yeah? So there is our minimum degree. Yeah, what's the minimum degree of a vertex? Delta of G is the maximum degree. And what I will just do average degree. This is like average degree. Yeah, so this is like the sum over degrees of V over vertices over the number of vertices. But we have already seen the basic lemma that the sum of degrees is twice the number of edges. So this is really twice the number of edges over the number of vertices. Yeah. So this is sort of like, I mean, if you hide this too, you can define it as a density of a graph. Somebody defines it as density. We prefer to think of average degree, which is like the average degree of the graph. Yeah, which is like exercise twice number of edges over the number of edges. Okay. So what we have proven here is that planar graphs have got average degree. At, so we can say that corollary like prime is like planar. G has minimum degree at most five, and average degree less than six. That's what we already proved there. Uh, okay, yep. Uh, but so, but let us observe things. So the following is not true. So we have proved this once, and based on this fact, we have proved the six color orbit. Okay? But it's not true. I mean, what I want to say is that these notions are somehow like not the best notions we want to use here, because it's not really true that, not true, If average degree or minimum degree of G is less than D, then G is the correct. I mean, this is simply not true. I mean, we, you, this is not true that the minimum degree or average degree being small gives you four six probability because of some examples that everybody can give. If you take a large peak, say of size n, and add, n cube guys here, 
say if you want to be connected, connected by one edges, by edges, then the minimum degree here is one. The average degree is something like one plus O of one over N, if you count it. I mean, these guys will like take the most mass, but this is of course and only n corrupted because of this large peak. Because of this, like, if you take a large peak and take much, much more guys of degree one connected to this peak, it's a connected graph which is only n corrupted, not less, but has got small average degree. Okay. In the proof for this corruptibility, we no, didn't use the fact that the input planar graph is uh, is like six. It has got minimum degree, but minimum degree at most five, or average degree at most six, less than six. But we have used the fact that after peeling the first vertex, there, it still has got vertex of degree five. Peeling another vertex has got the vertex of degree five. Peeling another vertex, still the vertex of degree five. So we <coughs> used the fact that not only the original graph was planar and has got these partially properties, but also all these induced subgraphs on the way there have there. Okay. So what I want to sell here, which was maybe not that explicit, was that having small minimum degree or having small average degree is not something that we can call it the graph sparse. I mean, graph of small minimum degree or graph of small average degree is not sparse. You shouldn't call like a huge clique with a humongous amount of pendant vertices a sparse graph because it's got this dense part. Okay? So what we want, we want notion which, um, we want some notion of sparsity which, uh, is close under the new subgraph so that we can do this induction. And our first attempt here is something which is called degeneracy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to define degeneracy. Uh -huh. yeah. So I want to find, define degeneracy, which is like this thing closed under taking subgraphs. So I want to say that degeneracy, degeneracy of G, of G is the maximum over all subgraphs of G. This is a subgraph, yeah? This is a subgraph. G, the minimum degree of H, okay? And maximum average degree is the maximum over H. G, uh, average degree. So I'm not looking at the minimum degree here, but I'm looking at the worst possible subgraph about the minimum degree, and the same for average degree. I look at the densest subgraph here in this sense. Okay, in the densest subgraph. So this is maximum average degree and the, the general C. Okay, and what we have here is that actually planar graphs have got not only these ones, but for double prime is like planar G has got the general C mode 5 and maximum average degree of less than 6. Yeah, this is like what we reproved because all subgraphs of planar graphs are, are uh, or subgraphs of planar graphs are uh, uh, or subgraphs of planar graphs are still planar so uh, we still have got small minimum degree and small average degree. Okay? And now with these notions we have got a true statement which is like now obviously true having seen the previous picture is that, uh, call it lemma, that uh, G is degeneracy of G plus one corrupt. Okay? Because what you do, I mean, let's repeat this proof. I mean, you have got the graph which is like degeneracy of G corrupt, called this degeneracy D, okay? So you can take a vertex, call it Vn of degree at most D, of degree at most D, remove it from the graph, take the next vertex of degree at most D, the remaining part, Vn minus one, remove it from the graph, take the next vertex, remove it from the graph, etc. As, uh, until you end up with the last vertex. And again, you have got at most D neighbors to the left. Yeah. Okay. And now you can call if you have got D plus one colors. You can start from here and color these vertices, and you always have a free color that's not used by your neighbors because you have got at most D colored neighbors. So the next guy have got a free color, and you can color the entire graph. Okay. So this is like, like the degeneracy gives you this coloring. This is like the correct definition for this coloring argument, and uh, yeah. So this is the correct definition for the coloring argument, 
And this thing, if you have got the general C, D, and you order the guys such that everybody have got at most D left neighbors, <laughs> this is sometimes called a degeneracy order. Degeneracy ordering. Okay? The ordering such that the maximum number of left neighbors is minimized is called the degeneracy order. Yeah, and the degeneracy of the order is what's the largest number of left neighbors of a guy. Okay. So this is um, something useful. Uh, yeah, so this is something, some useful. So bounded degeneracy seems like better notion of being sparse than minimum degree or average degree because it somehow like really shows that it's sparse on every level in every subgraph. It will be for some reason still not enough, so we'll be having on the lecture better definitions. But let's um, yeah, let's wait here for a while with this uh, degeneracy and let's make one more observation here. In this. Right forward, let's make one last observation. Uh, namely, that okay, so because minimum degree, well, let's me do it so that both things are on the camera. Yeah, because minimum degree is sm not larger than the average degree, then the degeneracy is smaller than math. Yeah, so if I've got that degeneracy is smaller than maximum degree, okay. But if the average degree, I mean, if the, uh, yeah, but uh, whenever you have got some average degree, maximum average degree, uh, then uh, there's always a guy of degree being graphed this maximum average degree. What I want to say is that there's still fine. Yep. So this lemma says that if average degree is something, then there's always a guy of degree at most the average, because that's definitely the average. And here, uh, the, and here you can use the fact, and here you can say that, okay, if you now count the edges here, if you now count the edges of any subgraph, there's at most d times the number of vertices. Yeah? If you pick up some subgraph, a few vertices, and some edges or other edges between them, then this guy has got also d edges, this guy has got also d edges, so like the number of edges of the graph, number of edges of the graph, it's smaller than uh, the generosity of the times the number of vertices of the graph. Just, uh, so, like, yeah, so you have put that, that the uh, average degree, the, the generosity of the graph. So, you have put that the max, and this is for all, all subgraphs, so I can put H here <coughs> and do it like for all subgraphs of D, and this is the generosity of D. Yeah, for all subgraphs, I mean, the, the generosity doesn't increase, so like number of edges is smaller than, than number of edges times generosity, because I mean, every guys, you can count all the edges from the like right end point in this ordering, and every guy is count, counts at least the at most the generosity edges, which means that like the average degree of H gets most twice the generosity of G. Yeah, because the average degree counts ratio of this by this times two. Okay, so we have got this inequality. So what I want to say is that maximum average degree is actually the same as the generous. Yeah? In general graphs, <coughs> average degree and minimum degree can be very different. I mean, you can have a degree of one vertex and something very complicated up there if that lifts the average degree. But if you do this subgraph close definitions, maximum average degree and the generous, they're roughly the same. Okay? In this lecture, this constant two won't matter in most cases. So we'll be really thinking about the generosity, and this maximum average degree will be sometimes a useful way of counting something, but this would be the main notion, or the main like first notion of sparsity, and this is some very closely related notion, which is like essentially the same up to f of two. Okay. So that's the generosity. We have learned something about the generosity. I want to now, yeah, I think I want to skip. So in the lecture note, you will find one more example of discharging showing that planar graphs are sometimes something are a bit more than like just the general graphs. I mean, that's obvious, but you can see that they're much more than general graphs. And there's like one more example in the lecture notes of discharging, and there's one more question that looks discharging like in the first as homework assignment. So look at the discharging things that's right. So if I will have the time at the end of the lecture, I will go over this thing, but I don't think I will. So I will go further uh, with some, some slightly more important or slightly more core parts. What I want to say now is that 
I told you that we are not going to prove the five color theorem on this lecture. I mean, in the sense that the five color theorem requires some like long distance Kempe-Chinese <coughs> arguments, which is not really about this lecture. This lecture is about like local definition of sparsity, like the degeneracy, like counting edges and these type of things. Uh, but the degeneracy is not is slightly too bounded degeneracy, like a graph of degeneracy at most 100, slightly too weak assumption for many things we want to do here. And as a motivating <coughs> example, let's take a subdivided clique. So let's subdivision takes an edge and puts a vertex in the middle. Okay? So a subdivided clique, I start with a clique, and put a <coughs> vertex into every edge. <coughs> okay, I put a vertex into every edge. So this is subdivided clique. Okay? Now, this graph is too degenerate. Yeah, to generate means the generality at most two, like actually exactly two. Yeah? In every subgraph, you either have got no edges or you see one of these guys of the degree at most two and you can peel him off. Okay? So this is the generality at most two. And the intuition is that this shouldn't be sparse. I mean, th if you start to do something which is not really a local thing, like, I don't know, vertex cover problem or this type of things, but something that is able to see within distance two or three, I don't know, distance two dominating set or this type of problems, when you are really like starting to, starting to see something within distance two or three, you start to see this click, and this shouldn't be a sparse instance, okay? So we'd like to somehow like disallow this type of examples, and we'll, do the correct definition of the next lecture, but next lecture. But now I want to go over another class of graphs, which is the generation of planar graphs, which forbids this type of things, but it's slightly too narrow for our needs uh, or for what we want to prove. So let's do a quick crash course on graph miners with only examples and nothing very deep. So. Uh, Okay. So what I want to say here is that, okay, edge construction. So if I have a graph, and in this graph there is an edge looking like this, okay, and this is U V, UV, then I want to contract the edge UV. Contract edge UV. Well, I replace it with a new vertex, call it X, okay, and I keep the same neighbors, okay? So there are these guys up there, they are still here, and this has got five names. So we can think of like collapsing this guy onto one, removing this loop, that this edge will become a loop, we will remove it, and we remove multiple edges. I mean, we don't, we keep our graph simple, we don't care about multiple edges. Okay, so this is like contracting the edge UV, and we say that H is a minor of G, if you can get H from G by a series of if you can get a series, you can delete an edge, you can delete a vertex, or you can contract an edge. Okay, so you can delete a, an edge, delete a vertex, or contract an edge. So you can, sometimes, somebody likes to phrase it as, you start from a subgraph of G and can contract some edges to get edge. Okay, for example, if you start with a 4 by 4 grid, then if I take this vertex, I contract these three guys onto each other, I contract, uh, wait, do I want to do it like this one? No, I want to do it. Contract these five guys onto each other, contract these two guys onto each other, and um, contract the other guys onto each other. So if I contract <coughs> these guys, I obtain a K4. Yeah, so now every, so I contract this five guys onto each other, this two guys onto each other, and this seven guys onto each other, and I keep this guy, I obtain a four vertex click. Okay? Or did I screw that something up? No, I think I did. Fine. Okay? There's something wrong with this example? Okay, so let's skip. So um, I obtained a four vertex click, and yeah. so that's contraction. <coughs> 
it's easy to observe that if you start a panograph and do contractions, you are still planar. Yeah, I mean, if you take this guy, you can visualize how they contract onto each other, collapse, and you have got your embedding still up there. Okay, so panographs are closed under the planars. You can phrase it this way. Yep. Uh, there, but I want to look at the different definitions. So I draw these blobs here. Okay. And slightly more useful definition for us is not to think of this as a process of contracting, but the process of drawing these blobs. So I want to say another definition is that there exists a model, a minor model of H. G. This is the sequence of blobs. So what does it mean? That means that there are subgraphs HV for V in V of H. These are connected subgraphs of G that are vertex disjoint. I mean, I cannot use two, one vertex into blocks that are vertex disjoint. And the edges are still there. That means that if there's an edge U, V in A, that means that there is some U prime in H, U, and V prime in H, V, which is an edge in G. Yeah, so I mean every edge in H is represented by some edge between the blobs. But after contracting the blobs, we'll stay there as an edge of, of the minor. Okay, so this is a minor model. Okay, good. So this is being minor. And we have got also something called topological minor, which uh, we'll try to squeeze here. We have something called topological minor, and the topological minor is better, easier to define. So, H is topological minor. You can again define the definition that you can delete edge, delete the vertex, but and you can contract, but you can contract only edges where the degree of one of those vertices is at most two, is two. So you can only contract a degree two vertex onto its neighbor. Okay, this is the only thing you can do. This is maybe cumbersome, the easier way of thinking of topological minor models. <coughs> First, for every vertex v in v of h, you find some image of v, which are these things, so this is injective. So every vertex from gets mapped to a, some, some vertex up there, and every edge gets mapped to a path. Gets mapped P of V between P of U and P of V. And these guys are vertex joint. Mm -hmm. And the paths are vertex joint, except for like the endpoints that need to not be joined. Like if two edges are shared the endpoints, then they, the paths are to the same vertex. Yeah? So and again an example, if I draw a grid. And recall that I have got colorful chalk that brought by me how. Then if I want to have got this guy, I map these vertices to like one, two. I will draw a larger grid to make my life easier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, I will take a few vertices up there. And I'll try to make connections and hope nothing good bad happen. One connection. Second connection, third connection, fourth connection. Mm. Fifth connection. And now I need to expand my grid. I wanted to show some grid. I want to expand my grid. Say that I can do it. But now I can do this one to connect this guy here. And I think I'm fine. Okay. One connection. Second connection, third, fourth, five, six, four. Yeah, so I have got my uh, minor up there. Good. So topological minor. Okay, so this is like topological minor. This is like uh, vertex minor. Two important remarks in place. If I have got in A <coughs> a guy of high degree, I need to put him here. Yeah, I mean the degree in H of V needs to be at most at this degree of G of I of V to the image. Yeah, because I need this path I need the place for these paths. Yeah, this path needs to go out 
in different directions to different vertices. So I need to have whether this is degree degree up there, okay? Which is not true in minors. So this is like an important remark that it's easy to make a the cubic graph, a graph of free rural, every vertex I've got degree three that contains as a minor large clicks. Essentially every random graph we have got up there or an expander if you know something about expanders, we have got the clicks. While you cannot have a K5 in a degree three vertex because you don't have vertices of degree four. Okay? So this is like the main difference between them that here you need these guys of high degree to, to get this image of pi. Here you need because you can because you need you can contract a bunch of guys of small degree to one guy of large degree. And this is actually the big difference, you, you, the main difference. You can prove some theorem saying that um, if you don't have some topological minor, then you can be composed by graph that you don't have the minor or your bounded degree, but this is beyond this lecture and don't know what to go into this detail. Yeah? So if you don't have some topological minor, that means that you have got small degree in some places of the graph and some parts of the graph you have got, don't have a minor, this particular minor, but this is beyond this lecture and we don't want to go into this as I don't want to like, say more about it. What's important for us is that planar graphs are close undertaking minors and topological minors because I mean, whatever you can draw in this block-like fashion or this connection-like fashion is still planar. And this is actually what we have here, which is called the, uh, what everybody knows, the characterization of planar graphs, which is like, one part of the theorem is Wagner, one part of the theorem is Kwiatowski. So it's like, is that the following are equivalent for G, the following are equivalent. Equivalent. Yep. G is planar. And I and G has neighbor K5 nor K3 as a minor. Uh, the same as the political minor. Actually, for planar graphs, like the minor minimal and the topological minor minimal graphs that are not planar are the same. These are K5 and K33, and this K5 and K33, okay? So we know the minor polarization, and this is like a very generic statement, yeah? You have got planar graphs. This is graph closed undertaking minors, okay? If you take a minor planar graph and topological minor planar graph, you have got still planar graph. So you can define minors as the set of minimal guys that are not planar. Yeah, you can think of, but <laughs> planar graphs are the graphs that don't have K5 nor K33 as a minor. Or no K5 nor K33 as a topological minor. Yeah, so there's like, you can think of class of graphs of this being, hey, it's minor closed, so I can point out which minors are not there and define the class in this way, okay? This is like equivalent definition of planar graphs. Yeah, you don't have K5 nor K33 as a minor, okay? So we sometimes call this class of graphs H minor free graphs, so like H minor free graphs. Yeah, these are this graph G, so that A is not a minor, not a minor, a minor of G. Okay? So, planar graphs is intersection of K5 minor free graphs and K33 minor free graphs, and you can also think of topological minor free graphs. Topological minor free graphs. Okay? So, this is some class of graphs, and you think of H as an abstract parameter of this graph class, like K100 or Peterson graph minor free graphs or something like that you have got your another minor closed graph class, okay? And the fact is that this graph class has got a lot of, to, still has got a lot of topological properties. A lot of things that we can prove in planar graphs has got, for, for topological properties, have got topological analogs of topological in minor free graphs because of some decomposition theorems which are very complicated and we don't want to go into details, but also it has got, it, it's of bounded degeneracy, so there's a theorem <coughs> saying is that if I exclude a kit KT, graphs are order of T square root of log T degenerate. Okay? So if I forbid some minor, 
I doesn't know right. I mean, this is like, I forbid the click, but if you forbid some graph, you're also <coughs> forbidding a click on the same number of vertices as a minor, so it's enough on some rough enough level to say that if you forbid some click as a minor, then <coughs> something happens. And we say that if you forbid a minor on t vertices as a, 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 a click on t vertices as a minor, we are t square root of log t. We won't prove this lemma. I will prove you now a simpler version with this one replaced with to do the t. So it will be still a lemma of the flavor. If we forbid some fixed click as a minor, we are constant degenerate, but the dependency here will be much worse. Okay? Yeah? So I will prove this with to do the t. This is something that, I mean, was hammered down uh, some time ago, but yeah. But. So let me go further. And let me go further. And so I want to prove the lemma that says that if G has no K to minor, then the number of edges is at most 2 to the T times number of edges. Okay, that's the my problem lemma, and yep. Uh, so uh, okay, so proof by induction <coughs> on the number of vertices. So for small cases, like obvious, yeah. I mean, uh, for small vertices, it's obvious. So let's uh, like empty graph or like obvious for I don't know just one vertex because there are no edges. Okay, so let's look, pick a vertex. So inductive step. Take a vertex and look at this label. So this call it A, this is the label for the B. Okay? The important observation is that in this neighborhood we cannot build a kt minus one. Okay? Because I mean this with this extra vertex will add the last branch set, the last one vertex blob, and we can we can't do it, yeah? So well, the observation is that g of a is k t minus 1 minus t. So we should probably also add something like t equals 2, which is also trivial, because there are also no edges there. So this, this thing has got this k t minus 2 minus 3, which means that it has got only a few edges. Okay? By induction, it's got only a few edges. Yeah. So the number of edges there, Okay, the number of edges there is smaller <coughs> than uh, 2 to the t minus 1 times size of a. That's induction. Okay? That's induction. We have a smaller graph with smaller t, so that's like induction on both dimensions. Um, I mean, the equals in both dimensions, which means that there's a vertex small degree. That means that there's a u in a, so that the neighbors of u in a is smaller than 2 in t. Okay, which means that, I mean, <coughs> if the number of edges is smaller than, this is like bound on the average degree, yeah, twice this one. It is edges times vertices bound, so the average degree is most twice this one, so <coughs> there's a vertex of this degree. Okay, what does it mean? So there's this guy u, and what's really this degree here? That there are common neighbors. It can get at most 2 to the t common neighbors up there. Okay, at most 2 to the t common neighbors. And now I want to actually recall that I want to have got a uh, non-empty graph, and I want to have got a string equality. Okay, so this is trivial, and I want to have got this one, so it has got less than two to the t complex. Okay, sorry for that. Mm, I did correct in the notes, and now I forgot. So this neighbors have got less than two to the t common neighbors, and there's an edge here. Now I want to say that I can safely construct this edge. What happens if I contract this edge? Okay? If I contract this edge, so if G prime is G after contracting G of G, <coughs> well, I lose one vertex, by how many edges do I lose? The point is that, okay, I lose this edge that I contract here, and all the edges that were common neighbors, there's a double edge that I lose. Okay? So what I want to say is that the number of edges of G prime is larger than the number of edges of G, and I lose this one edge up there, okay? 
I lose this one edge here, and I lose less than two to the t at most two to the t minus one ed edges from the common neighbors, the double edges that already did one of them. Okay, so which is like, and this is exactly what I wanted. Yep, this is exactly what I wanted. Uh, if I, uh, I mean, I, I contracted one, so I lost one vertex, and I proved that I lost at most two to the edges. So by induction, this is bounded by the number of vertices of G, two to the t times number of vertices of G minus one. Okay, it's bounded, and this is exactly what we want because there's two to the t up here. Okay, so this was a simple proof to get something better. You need to work harder, but we have proven a lemma saying that guys without minor are degenerate. Some, something different, okay? So again, there are something colorable by the same reason. Okay, and they have got few edges by the same reason. Okay, I mean, because they're degenerate. Okay, so there's a graph of the minor. The problem with graphs of the minor is that you can prove too much about graphs of the minor with topological reasonings. And we want to go slightly beyond graphs of tuning minor, excluding fixed minor in the future lectures to be able to say how much we can prove with the sparsity arguments based on degeneracy and some slightly more advanced notions of degeneracy to kill this example of subdivided clique, but without using this whole structure theorem of uh, the whole structures of top minor free graphs. Okay, I have got 20 minutes left. So I will proceed to the with notions because I wanted to show you one or two more examples of uh, sparse graphs, which will be like interesting uh, for us up there. So, and I want to somehow change a bit the way I'm speaking about uh, the graphs now, because I want to think about widths of the graph or measuring how the graph is simple. No. Okay. So I want to measure how the graph is simple and I want to wipe out this one. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, and so I want to measure how the graph is simple and I want to introduce some width measure. So the width measure, take the graph and measure some width, so measure some number, some, some, some number, usually an integer. And this is a non negative integer, and this integer, like the smaller this integer is, the graph, the simpler the graph is. And we want to like somehow measure these things. And okay, that's blah, the high level blah blah, let's do some example. One of the most important measures in the architecture will be something called tree depth. <coughs> okay, and tree depth of a graph will denote it TD of G. Let's define it recursively. So TD of empty graph. Is zero, TD of empty graph is zero, and otherwise, if G is disconnected, and we have connected components G1 of to GK, then we take the maximum, and if G is connected, we try to delete one vertex, pay one by for deleting one vertex, and it records. So we want TD of G to be one plus minimum over V of G, TD of G minus V. So think of this as like the following game. You have a graph and you want to destroy it as quickly as possible. Your option is to recursively decompose over connected components, so to do in parallel your connected components, or kill a vertex. So what you want to do really uh -huh. let's move a bit here. What you want to really to do, you want to take your whole graph, split it into connected components. In every connected component, kill one vertex. The rest splits into connected components. In every connected component, kill one vertex. Some of the connected components may split into smaller, some may not. Kill a vertex. This is the connected components, kill the vertex, this one may not fit, kill another vertex. Okay, some of them may split, some of them will not fit into connected components, some of them will split, etc. Okay, so I take a 
decomposing connected components, killer vertex. Decomposing connected connect components, killer vertex. And the height of this recursion procedure is my tree depth. Okay, the best possible height of this recursion procedure is my tree depth. Okay? Good. So, how do you think about it? The other way of thinking about this, if you think about this procedure, you draw sort of a rooted forest. Yeah, if you take this vertex, make this one, this guy's children, and so forth. Take this one up there. So what I want to say here is that the tree depth of G is the minimum height of a rooted forest F such that uh, such that there is a bijection I from G of G. I mean you can um, identify the vertices of G with the rooted forest. Guys, so that every edge is an like ancestor descendant relation. So that for every u b in the p of g, i of u, the pi of t are like ancestor descendant. Yeah, so they are like one is a pa one is a grand, grand great grand grandparent of the other one. Okay, and yeah, that's why. So here the edges will be like because we decompose always the connected components. There's always an edge with the Upper guy with a lower guy, there are no edges between different parts because we split them into connected parts. Okay? So this is a uh, tree depth of the graph, and this is a notion which will be like quite important for us for measuring. Like, I mean, you can think of like a graph of tree depth three is actually quite simple. Yeah, you kill a vertex, split, kill a vertex, and uh, it's like the vertices. I mean, there. so guys of small tree depth look simple, but is actually quite important notion for us. And what we want to have here is that we want to have, uh, one, yeah, so this is three depth, and we want now to understand. Uh, so first, this definition shows that there are only a few edges, yeah? Because how, in this picture, the edges can go only from a great-grand-grandchildren to great-great-grandparent, okay? Which means that every guy can have got only three depth guy edges upwards, okay? Because upwards it can only see parent, great grandparent, great grandparent, etc. Okay, so this guys obviously like the number of edges of the graph is smaller than this number of edges of the graph times three depth of the graph, actually minus one. Okay, uh, so mm, so you have mm -hmm. got your degeneracy. I mean, three depth is obviously close under deleting edges and deleting vertices because I mean. The decomposition stays the same if you remove a vertex or an edge, I mean, the same or <laughs> the first thing the same. So you have got your notion, you have got your sparsity if you have a small tree depth. But now I want to use, uh, yeah, I want to use the next few minutes to relate tree depth to the degeneracy in the other way. So remember that in the degeneracy, we had to have this idea that the degeneracy had got this degeneracy order. So that, uh, you can order the guys such that the degeneracy was the, like the maximum number of left neighbors. Okay? So now I want to make another definition, namely of reachable sets. So I want to define, my goal now is to define tree depth as a notion there exists a tree depth ordering. Like for degeneracy, you can say there exists a degeneracy ordering with maximum number, with degeneracy being the bound on the number of left neighbors. And I want to say tree depth is the same as ordering the guys to bounding the size of something called weak reachable sets. So I want to make an analogous definition of tree depth, which is by ordering, not by this recursive procedure. Okay? For that, I need the definition of the weak reachable sets and strong reachable sets. Hmm? Okay? So let's order the vertices of the graph. So I have got a graph G, and let's have an order V1, V2, Vn. And I will use letter sigma to denote this order. This is some order of the vertices, okay? And let's pick some guy V here, VI here, okay? And I want to say the following, that some VJ is weakly reachable <coughs> from VI, so it's weakly reachable from VI, if there exists there is a path P from VI up to VJ. So that the VJ is the earliest guy. So that the VJ is the sigma minimum on P. Uh, 
I will draw an example up there. Okay, so oh, let me draw an example downstairs. So I have got. Let's focus on this guy. Okay, and let's draw him the following pictures. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <coughs> eight. Okay, okay. Let's make and let's look at this guy. Okay, and what's weak reusable from this guy? Well, uh, what's weak reusable? Wait, I want to walk on a path from this guy, such so that the our end point is the earlier guy in the order, the most leftmost guy in the order. Okay, so I can walk to this guy. I mean, there's an empty path going to this guy. There's this path going to this guy. There's this path going to this guy. There's this path going to this guy. And there's also like, we can prolong this path going to this guy. Okay? But this guy is not in a weak reach of the sets because the only way to get from here to there is to go here and back. And then this guy won't be the minimum. This guy is on the path and is area. Okay? And also the same happens here. So I can use these guys, but they're not the minimum because this guy is on the path. But I can use these guys and then jump here. And this will be in a weak reach our set, and also this guy will be in the weak reach our set. Okay? And also, if I like, <coughs> let me add one more path, one more jump. Let me add also this, then this one is also in the weak reach our set, because I can jump here and go here, and this will be the minimum of this whole long path up here from this guy. Okay? So these colored guys are in the weak reach our sets, and I want to say that, uh, yep, to the side. And I want to have also a strong root trouble set. Strong root trouble. Again, if there's path from VI to VJ, such that all the middle guys are to the right, all internal vertices are larger than J, the I. That's right. What does it mean? That means that I there's only the guys <laughs> that I can reach using these guys as intermediate vertices. Okay? Which means that this is this guy. <coughs> this is this guy because there's this path. It doesn't have intermediate vertices, so it's okay. And I can use this guy to get here. I can use these two guys to get here, but nothing more. There are these four vertices. I mean to uh, to get for example, here, I would need to go here and here. So use this as intermediate vertices, which is not to the right of the starting point. And the same here. These guys were prior using these guys or this guy as intermediate vertices. Okay? So I have got these four guys as strong as strong each other. Uh, so just to sign in the chat, uh, weak, uh, weak reachability and strong reachability are the property are a property of a graph with an order. Yes, order. and the vertex from which we start, yeah. We fix an order here, yeah. So, excellent thing, we can do a notion. <coughs> we can do now a notion saying that, yeah, there's a weak reach of the set, which of a graph G, ordering and from a vertex we start, and a strong reach of the set. Yeah, and of course, the one is a subset of the other. Okay, so we have a strong reach of the set and a weak reach of the set. And this is like the vertex you start from, the graph, and the order you are walking on. Okay? And now the lemma that I want to, uh, I want probably much to show you now, but maybe we'll do it later on the tutorials, is that the lemma <coughs> is that the trigger of the graph is the minimum over orders, maximum over vertices. Uh, size of the weak reach of the set. <coughs> so take an order and you try to minimize the largest weak reach of the set. And this task is exactly getting triggered. Okay? So in digital asset ordering, we're worrying about the edges going to the left. Now we are worrying about the guys reachable by paths that don't go and return to the guy later so that the, <coughs> the, the target of your path is the is the last guy is the leftmost guy on the path okay and now I want to do a p 
object, I want to add infinity here to the presentation. Now it will maybe mysterious for you, uh, but we later introduce the same recruitable sets with bounded length, so that we'll be bound the length of these paths by some constant, and, in, and uh, study this distance constraint with reachable sets and distance constraint strong reachable sets, and this, num this infinity will change into the bound. So we put here infinity and say that we don't constrain the length of this path in these definitions. Okay? Now, mm, I think I want to. Okay, let's. I think I want to try to use the few last names to prove this lemma instead of going to another weak parameter that we can discuss on the lecture or, or on the tutorial. So let's try to prove this lemma. So we need to go into both directions. I mean, we need to, in some sense, go from tree depth to the ordering and from ordering to the tree depth. But let's do by induction. Yeah, let's do induction. Size of G and the one vertex graph is tree depth. The tree did at least one, and the largest weak reach, at least one ordering, and the weak reach of the set weak one. Okay? Good. So, induction over number of vertices, and yeah. so let's, let's uh, first think of where should the guy that's like, okay, so let's do the induction, like let's take a graph G for all small graphs we, are, we have proven the induction. So, we can go two cases. I mean, from the definition of tree depth, either graph is disconnected. Or the graph is connected. Okay? In case one, G is disconnected, and there are components G1 up to GK. Okay? This is the easy case. Because what do I mean? The tree depth, the tree depth, I will just pick it out, spell it out. The tree depth is the maximum tree depth over connected components. And the best ordering will be also the best ordering over connected components. You think about weaker each other sets, and you just take few connected components <coughs> and like interlace them as you wish. Okay, the weaker each other sets will stay with only one component. So you could as well isolate every connected component and put them aside one by one in the ordering. It won't change the weaker each other sets. Okay, so like what I'm just saying is that this one behaves as a max over connected components. And this one behaves as a max over connected component. Because it will just optimize the order separately on over, over every connected component. Okay? So now let's go to the second interesting case that G is connected. Okay? G is connected. And this requires going and using the piece of the board. Connected, and we want to prove the the thing in both directions. So let's first take the guy x vertex. That this is the guy that we put on the top in the decomposition. Yeah. So this is the guy. So that three depth of g. This is the guy to delete. This is one plus three depth of g minus g. This is the optimal guy to delete to get better three depth. Yeah. The guy on the top of the composition. Okay. And the natural thing is that uh, he should be put first. The intuition is that what we want to do, we want to take the street the street of the composition that was here, I just wiped it out, and more or less order it top to bottom in our order. So that every guy in the weak reach of the sets will have got only the ancestors. That's like the intuition what we want to say. If you take this order, this thing, and order it top to bottom, the guy will see all its ancestors in the thing because to go to another subtree, he will need to go for somebody earlier and go back, and that would be pro prohibited in the weak reach of the sets definition. Okay, that's the intuition. So proof, well, uh, okay, but this is, but this, but by induction, this there exists an order sigma prime <coughs> of g minus v p such that three that of g minus v is exactly the maximum over v over w in g minus v, the weak reach of the set in g minus v sigma prime w. Okay? So there's the uh, so there's an order that realizes the true depth, <coughs> okay, by induction. And now I want to say that let's say sigma is like first v and then to sigma prime. Put v as the first guy in the order. 
Okay? Then what I want to say is that every weak reachable set gets extra V, but nothing more. Okay? The weak reachable set doesn't change. I mean, there's no path going through V and going backwards, because that's pro pro forbidden definition of weak reachable sets. So in every reachable set, weak reachable set stays the same. Possibly V enters it. If V will be always reachable, actually. But V enters. What I'm going to say is that the set the weak reachable set in G sigma W is actually V plus weak reachable set in G minus V sigma prime W. Yeah, that's the only thing that happens if you put somebody up front is that this guy joins your weekly shovel sets if you're connected, but otherwise the weekly shovel set doesn't change because this guy's not useful in, to, in this path in the definition of weekly shovel sets. Okay? So that means that there's one new guy in which we shovel sets. That means that in this order, the maximum over W size of weekly shovel sets in G sigma W is actually 1 plus 3 that of G minus V, which is 3 of G. Okay, let's take the formal check. Okay, yep, and in the other direction, the other direction, now, so this is the, the order saying that what did we do here is that we take the tree depth, so what we have really proven here is that uh, there's an order getting tree depth. So we have proven inequality uh, that tree depth is larger. Yeah, we have proven here tree depth of G is larger than this mean max. Than this mean max. Okay? So we have proven that there is an order smaller than tree depth. Okay? In the other direction, well, uh, let's take the order. Let's take the best order. So let's take the sigma of the best order for G. And then we want to say like the opposite wise. We want to say that the first guy in the order is the best guy to delete at the beginning in the tree depth decomposition. Okay? So let's take V is the first guy in this order. In this order. And the crucial observation here is that this guy is always in the weak reachable set. Because G is connected, then for every vertex, V is in this weak reachable set. Okay? This is because it's connected, so there's always a path from W to V, and this guy will be always the minimum guy on this path because it's minimum in the entire graph. Okay? So what I want to say here is that, uh, what I want to say here is that, okay, uh, the <coughs> if I delete V, all the weak reach of the sets get down by one. Okay? What I want to say is that this minimum in <coughs> over W inside uh, V of G minus V max the minimum no, no. <coughs> I want to say that max over W inside of V of G minus V size of the weekly shadow set of G minus V sigma W yep, is exactly <coughs> the max over W V of G size of W H G sigma w. So if you visit this first vertex, uh, minus one. Yet all, all these weak reachable sets lose v from its set. Yeah? And by induction, this one is three depth of g minus v. Okay, and uh, yep, so this is actually uh, so this is actually then larger than the three depth of g. So this uh, so this order, yeah, this max. Side of the reach of G sigma W uh, is actually larger than three depth of G. Uh, because it's larger than the three depth of some guy. <coughs> okay. yeah. It's yeah, you can see in the lecture notes it's like spelled out properly. But the intuition is like the intuition of this proof is that the correct ordering should be like the by rows or any like top to bottom order of this. The composition tree for three depth that should be the order for this weekly shuttle sets because then you see only the ancestors <coughs> the weekly shuttle sets so i think i run out of time uh, we meet for tutorials in 26 minutes 
Uh, and there's a bunch of simple exercises about planning graphs and all this stuff. Thanks.